Good afternoon, everyone, and it is a great pleasure and honor to be here, and I have to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this really distinguished meeting, which we all enjoy, and it's very interactive, and I loved uh, all of the presentations so far, and I'm looking forward to many more. Anyway, so the topic that I've been commissioned with is regarding how we achieve a area under the curve that is satisfactory, and we maintain this fine balance between uh, keeping the dose fairly reasonable as well as managing to maintain optimal efficacy with balancing the toxicities in between. So the official definition of area under the curve is the integral of the plasma concentration of the agent versus an interval of definite time. So here is the definition, but bottom line, what it means to all of us as when we are clinically facing a patient is that it allows us the measurement of the bioavailability of an agent that you're using uh, and allows us to balance it with the efficacy and eventually toxicity. So I have here in my estimate what the factors are that impact area under the curve. Compliance is a huge one, uh, the, the dose of course, schedule, absorption, and there are different ways of uh, you know, that there are different things that can interfere food and other drugs and multiple other things that we've seen that have interacted with uh, each of these agents. And then, of course, the pharmacogenetics, pharmacokinetics of the agent can affect and have a significant amount of impact on the efficacy and the toxicities noted. And toxicities, of course, which will have a huge impact on your area under the curve because if you have a significant toxicity that makes you completely either discontinue the agent or hold it temporarily for quite a while, that is again going to have an impact on your AUC. So the impact of compliance, which is not frequently discussed, but is huge, and one of the reports shows this is the actual uh, population data survey of the impact of compliance on medications, treatment prescribed to treatment filled, there is an actual prescription uh, drop off right there. And then eventually, if you're looking at the treatment continued, which as you can see in kidney cancer, we are not doing sporadic treatments anymore. We are more vested in the continuous part of the treatment. And treatment continued at least is seen in this 47% uh, range. So about half of the patients will be compliant with the medication. Now this is generally across different medications. The good news is that compliance is fairly much, much better in cancer patients. So studies that have been specifically done in cancer patients show us that compliance with oral agents is actually very good. So, and these are very small, very limited studies, but this was a study of sunitinib where patients, 36 patients were surveyed and watched very carefully for their compliance, and only two patients were non-compliant, and the reason for the non-compliance, of course, was toxicity, that they had grade three or four toxicities of some shape or form. Interestingly, though, the other 13 patients who had these kind of severe toxicities or adverse events related to sunitinib actually continued on the same dose. So it's not absolute given, and what we find is that patients who are being treated for their cancer with uh, therapy actually stay compli remarkably compliant despite in the face of significant toxicities. So the other things, of course, are the who, who what, where, when of uh, medications in kidney cancer. And uh, one of the studies has been looking at exposure and dose response. What we do know about sunitinib is that the, increase, the increasing dose can result in better exposure. And uh, there are studies that show us improvement in efficacy with increasing dose. Obviously, the toxicities also go high up, and it's not a direct relationship. As you can see, there are some people who at 50 milligrams or, or even less doses have e equal values of uh, PKs or AUC as somebody with a much higher dose of 75 milligrams of sunitinib. 
So here is the study that showed you that the time to progression as well as overall survival was improved with increasing doses. And this was a study again of sunitinib done in both kidney cancer as well as GI stromal tumors, basically showing you that the higher the dose, the better the efficacy to a certain extent. Interestingly, though, clinical studies are showing us that that didn't quite result in actual improvement in efficacy. And uh, as you're probably familiar with the Mozart study, which uh, compared patients with 50 milligram four, uh, four weeks on, two weeks off schedule with the 37.5 milligrams continuous schedule. And if you look at the median progression-free survival or overall survival for that matter, it actually was no different with uh, and maybe slightly inferior with the continuous dosing as compared to the four weeks on, two weeks off schedule. Interestingly, if you just look at dose intensity, it's actually somewhat higher with the 37.5 milligrams daily compared to the 50 milligram over six weeks because if you calculate it out per daily dose, it ends up being about 33.33. So uh, interestingly, it may not be the dose intensity, but there might be a threshold that you have to hit to actually get to that efficacy endpoint is one of the thinking behind why these studies are not showing you a major difference in efficacy. And these, the other two studies I have listed there are phase two trials that again looked at the continuous dosing and came up with similar results that no difference and definitely not better than the 50 milligram four weeks on, two weeks off dose. Again, some more clinical data that uh, tells us that dose escalation didn't quite get us where we want it to be in terms of improvement in efficacy is the excitinib dose titration study. And this was a study of starting off with five milligram twice daily, 213 patients were treated. Anybody with progression, severe toxicities, of course, was taken off the study. And then after that, the patients who were tolerating it okay were randomized to either get escal dose escalated up to 10 milligrams twice daily versus placebo. And the response rates and uh, progression free survival, as you can see here, was no different and definitely no better with the dose escalation as compared to placebo. So again, there might be that threshold effect that you see have to see in terms of efficacy, and then beyond that, the incremental uh, advantage tends to be fairly small with a major increase in toxicity. Uh, there are some patient populations that were found to be susceptible to um, uh, increased uh, toxicity rates and, for instance, the, there were PK studies that were done with sunitinib that showed about 8% of the patients had, uh, had a dose uh, PK levels that were at the same level at 50 milligrams that were seen at, for instance, 75 milligram doses. So, so there is that variation, obviously, and female gender and low body weight, people with a lot of weight loss, tend to be the more uh, likely people who have this kind of significant uh, dose level increases. And uh, you know, right now, we don't have any good predictive markers to say upfront who is likely to get increased risk of toxicity. So going back to the PKPD profile of targeted therapy, you know, I think it's pretty similar for any therapy. Obviously, in this kind of treatment, because you have vested for patients who are benefiting in the longer term of therapy, you're looking at the met metabolism of the drug and uh, the chances of absorption and eventual bioavailability to maintain the efficacy uh, effect. And pharmacogenomics, really, there are some SNPs that have been reported, usually in the metabolism enzymes, the cytochrome P450 system, that have been associated with increased risk of toxicity with sunitinib, pazapinib, and some for mTOR inhibitors as well, that have been reported. Again, no exact correlation has been noted as yet, so there are more studies should would have to be ongoing in this regard. Same thing for genome-wide association 
studies have identified different loci that result in differences in the accumulation rate of metabolites, and the range is really very fairly wide from 10 to 60 percent, which obviously could have an impact on the toxicity rates. And there is always that 8 to 10 percent of the patients that we, when we start treatment, completely unpredictably have a significant amount of toxicity within the first few weeks of therapy even. So my conclusions of all of this come up with that pharmacogenetics at present, there are none, no real uh, tests that we can recommend that are ready for prime time in predicting the incidence of severe toxicities in these patients. The, additionally, the dose schedule and dose intensity and probably hitting that threshold dose for the patient does make a difference in terms of efficacy. But clinically, when you look at populations or groups uh, in randomized setting, the dose escalation beyond the standard dose has not been proven to be of any uh, improvement in efficacy. And currently, we are stuck back with our optimizing targeted therapies based on our clinical factors, such as response and toxicities, and that still remains the current standard. Thank you for your attention.